I keep ending up in situations where lots of people are interested in TPMs, and I, I find that kind of odd. Um, first, first, a little bit about who I am. Uh, it turns out that I'm a builder of infrastructure. It's taken me a long time to work out what I do for a day job, and I build infrastructure. I have uh, built networking infrastructure. I've worked for Cisco. I've done OpenFlow. Um, I've built storage. I've done iSCSI, Fiber Channel, Enterprise Storage. Um, I ran a small UK ISP, so I've done you know networking side from that in terms of infrastructure. I'm a Debian developer, uh, primarily involved in the management of Debian's open PGP keyring for developers. Um, and these days, I'm kind of related to what I'm talking about here. Um, I do infrastructure security at Meta. Um, platform security, in particular, focused on host integrity and using TPMs to sort of give us some measure of how can we be sure that the platform we're running on is the platform we expect. So from a bare metal point of view, rather than the containerized point of view, but providing that secure foundation that all of the, the rest of the container infrastructure can run on. Um, I am based in Belfast in the UK. Um, if you want to stalk me, I am on the Fediverse at that one, or if you want to look at my more professional thing, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, if you can't guess my email address, given that information, then you probably don't want to email me anyway. Um, what am I going to talk about today? I'm going to talk about TPMs on servers. Um, there's a lot of use of TPMs, right? There's an entire TPM track here. Um, people have been talking about TPMs and actually making use of them more over the last few years. A lot of that is well established. What I haven't seen is a lot of discussion about using TPMs at scale, right? So what are the problems operationally about rolling them out? What can we do with them from a server point of view rather than a client point of view? Um, I know Cloudflare have done some stuff with this. I've seen some of their patches and some of their discussions about that. But generally, I don't know people using this sort of stuff in data centers. Um, I would love someone to come and tell me I'm wrong and someone has done a talk about this and point me at a, a URL where I can go and watch it. But equally, if people can't talk about it publicly, I would love people to come and talk to me afterwards about what they're doing and see whether we've got some sort of common problems going on. I'm going to talk about what we're generally trying to do with TPMs. I'm going to talk about some of the constraints that exist in our environment. Um, we've done a bunch of data collection, I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about some of the future work we have planned. All of this is currently a work in project progress. Um, while we are doing some of this in our production systems at the minute, we have not fully completed this project, so it is in a state of flux, and in a year's time I might tell you something different, but I'll tell you where we're at at the moment. We've done this for, been doing this current project for coming up to a year now. Um, we have probably about 10 years experience of TPMs in our production network on and off for various reasons. So there's a bunch of stuff I can talk about. Um, there are war stories I will not go into here, but I can definitely talk about on a boat later. Um, so current project, what we want to do is protect keys across our servers. Things like key exfiltration is a big one, whether that's an accidental thing like the, the Microsoft um, problem where they had a core dump off a server that then went on a developer's laptop that happened to contain a key, um, that could actually happen to anyone, right? We take core dumps off servers to analyze them. It would be nice if there was no way that a private key could inadvertently leak in that core dump. So let's see if we can protect that. Um, there are deliberate attacks where people might try and exfiltrate keys. Uh, developers have this nasty habit of taking production keys and then doing some testing using that production key. And we'd kind of like to make that harder for them so they realize it's a bad idea. Um, we have a tool called SKS, uh, Secure Key Service, um, written in Go. There's a link there. We use that in our corporate fleet for um, SSH and X509 certificates for end users. Um, using that at scale across TPMs in, in the, the client side. Uh, again, this is sort of something that's fairly well established, but we're like, okay, so we've done this well for user credentials. Can we use this same sort of approach for server side credentials? And, and that's kind of where we started out with. Um, however, um, user Logins very much initiated by the user, not really a high performance requirement. If there's a little bit of a lag in the initial connection, that's okay because you're not making you know hundreds of them a second. Not quite the case with um, TLS for incoming connections. That becomes a huge bottleneck. TPMs are horrendously slow. Um, they are not hardware security modules. So what do we do there? Um, and we went backwards and forwards on this. One option was we could use the TPM to back a key that would then be a local CA, tie that CA down to the host name so that it can only issue client search for that machine. 
The problem with that is that you can then generate certs for any service that might be running on that machine. You tie it to the host name, but not necessarily to the actual service or identity that would be on that machine. Uh, there was some discussion about could we add constraints, but it turns out those constraints would then fail open. Anything that didn't understand the X509 constraints would ignore them and then allow the cert to do anything. So you're given the ability for, yes, you can't exfiltrate the primary key, but you can use it to mint a key for any service you want. So. The approach we've gone is something called delegated credentials. Uh, that is an existing RFC. Again, Cloudflare and Meta have both been involved with that. That lets you take an issued certificate from a, a normal CA and delegate responsibility to a key for only what that key can do. Um, that feels closed. If there's not an understanding of what the delegated credential is, then you don't get access. Perfect. Um, this lets us do short-lived uh, certificates or short-lived keys on the host that are backed by the TPM, can be issued locally, stored only in memory, but then don't have a dependency on that external CA. So yes, we still have an in-memory key that could be exfiltrated, but the lifetime on it can be sufficiently low that that's not such a big concern, um, and there is no external dependency created, so we're not reducing reliability um, in terms of blast radius of what goes wrong if the CA is temporarily down or anything like that. The other problem we've got is that we are not alone in our use of TPMs in the fleet. Um, there are we have some use of attestation on our fleet, not as much as we once had, but certainly some high, um, high risk machines sort of where we have less physical control of them are using full machine state attestation. We need to coexist with that. Um, while we were in the middle of this project, System D ran out, uh, rolled out their System D TPM on boot up. Um, which tries to create a storage key. It turns out it doesn't cope very well if you've got passwords set on your TPM, so suddenly we had to mask that out. Um, we would like to coexist better with the general Linux ecosystem about TPMs. I think there's a more work going on these days about making use of them. Um, we have obviously gone a parallel path, but one that is quite similar, so it would be nice to sort of work out how to integrate. And we have on our list of how do we either add appropriate functionality into system DTPM or modify our own usage in a way that they then can coexist. Um, so given all of that, the other thing is servers are not the same as laptops. Um, if someone cannot connect to a service on their laptop, then they will retry, they will restart their browser, they will restart their machine, um, they will do a whole bunch of things before they bother to call a help desk or um, complain at you loudly about the fact things don't work. Um, Servers, not so much, right? If the TPM gets unhappy, then you suddenly stop being able to serve traffic and that's a problem. We do not want the remediation to be that we suddenly reboot a whole bunch of servers in the fleet whenever the TPM gets unhappy. So we needed to understand, you know, does the TPM have problems if it's up for three months, right? Compared to maybe, you know, a week or a month for a, an end user laptop. Um, is there a problem with the usage patterns we will have in terms of maybe much more access to the TPM? What, what's going on there? Um, can we be confident that if we use these TPMs at scale in the fleet, and we're talking across millions of machines, right? So the, a small percentage of failures will cause a large number of problems for us. How, how do we deal with that? We need to do some TPM setup before use. As I mentioned, uh, we set passwords on our TPMs, we take ownership. Some of that comes from the TPM 1.2 days that we're thankfully no longer having to support, but there is an established infrastructure where we set well-known passwords on our TPMs. Um, we provision our EK into a persistent handle. We provision our um, storage root key, owner hierarchy, primary key. Um, into the uh, into a well-known handle, given that we're going to use it, we can put those both in persistent handles. Sorry, I realize I'm using a lot of TPM acronyms on the assumption that we're in a TPM track and therefore people will know what I'm talking about. Do feel free to stop me and ask if I need to expand anything or there's time for questions at the end and I can clarify. Um, so there is a bunch of setup we need to do on a new machine and it turned out that we had you know several million machines that hadn't had this done. So we needed to build some tooling. Um, we built it in Go. Google's Go TPM libraries are incredibly good. When we started looking at this, yes, Rust is the new hotness. There was no good TPM2 bindings for Rust. Um, we did not want to write this in C. So we've gone down the Go path. This actually works quite well for us because we can build a single binary that we can easily distribute around the fleet. We can put on sort of new machines to test out whether they got the functionality. Um, this Swiss Army tool lets us do the provisioning, lets us do some common TPM operations. Uh, not dissimilar to what TPM tools lets you do. 
true. We did originally have a set of Python that wrapped the TPM2 tools. Turns out relying on command line interfaces for production infrastructure tends to be a bad idea. Even in the sort of TPM2 tools 5 range, they changed the way in which you specify ECC key definitions. So like even minor things um, changed. So we built some tooling to say go. Um, it's worked very nicely for us. Uh, when we come to do attestation, again, Google have a bunch of decent libraries for that. So. Uh, makes our lives easy. They're also very responsive to having conversations about things we wanted, like they tagged a new release with some functionality we needed that didn't exist, um, and it turned out that someone else submitted that functionality while we were thinking, oh, we need to fix this. Uh, so that's, that's nice to see a, a positive ecosystem there. Um, so what do we do once we've got um, the tooling? What we started to do was query TPMs over time. Uh, we have the fleet, we run some monitoring, we have some data collection. Don't worry too much about what's on the right hand side. I got told that people are going to try and read that. It's mostly to show that there are a bunch of things that go on with the TPMs on our fleet. So we started out by let's query TPMs and check firmware versions and model numbers to make sure we know what TPMs are actually out there. And it turns out our fleet mostly runs sort of two different varieties of TPMs depending on what the base hardware is. Um, we have a couple of different firmware versions, neither of which are a problem. One of them is just from a newer TPM. Um, that's all good. We then extended it to right now we've actually got that collection process working. Let's do some basic sanity testing on the TPM. So we're doing like a basic self-test. Um, we're doing a, a seal and an unseal operation where we sort of take some data, try to seal it to the TPM, make sure that succeeds, unseal it, make sure that that comes back as what we put in. That's intended to give us a full cryptographic round trip of is the TPM happy. Um, turns out mostly yes. Um, but some really odd problems we see. Um, we've got TPMs that appear to go into shutdown every now and again, like a very small, not even a percent, but they just sort of stop responding. And then you reboot the machine and then they come back. Power cycle only, it's not a software issue. You're like, is this a kernel issue? Let's do a K-exec, didn't come back, still not seen. Do an actual reboot of the machine through the BIOS, TPM gets reset, comes back, it's fine for like not even, it's not even like it's fine for just an hour, it could be fine for days or weeks. Um, so we've got some issues going on there. We are trying to nail that one down, but we have no reliable reproducer, right? We know if we wait for long enough, we can see it in the machine. It might be a physical characteristic of the machine. There's been some suggestion it's a temperature or voltage fluctuation that causes the TPM to decide to, to shut down. Um, we're not entirely convinced about that. It could be a firmware issue. We've had some conversations where, oh yeah, there's this weird bug we sometimes see that we've been chasing with someone else for two years. It might be the same thing. Let's talk. Um, we see leaked handles. I submitted a patch to the kernel a couple of weeks ago about um, timeouts on the TPM, then meaning that session state got leaked. So the transient keys ended up still in the TPM. If you connected to the kernel resource broker again, um, it couldn't see them anymore because the connection had been closed. The fix is going into 612. Um, Linux integrity tends to be fairly responsive, right? There's a bunch of good stuff going on there about that. So um, what, we're, what I'm saying is that we are still seeing a bunch of minor issues with TPMs across the fleet. Like, like there's even allowing for the fact that we've still got a bunch of things that need to be provisioned and everything. The machines that we have provisioned are by and large reliable over 90 days, right? That's our sort of time window of is the machine happy for a full three months. Um, and, and that seems to happen, but there's all these sort of niggly things where we're trying to nail down, well, is this, are, are we talking to the TPM in an odd way? Is it something about the physicality of the machine that that would be more worrying? Is it a TPM firmware issue that's the problem? Um, and they're really hard to nail down because, as I say, reproducibility, right? I can test these things and then I've got to wait for, you know, at least a month to work out whether or not I'm seeing those things. So. I would love to talk to anyone else who's done this at scale and is either not seeing anything or is seeing similar problems. Um, the other thing that comes back to is, um, yeah, we can put the key in the TPM, we can issue certs based on that. That doesn't give us any actual testable indication of security at that point, right? So. Um, what we're going to do next and what we're in the process of doing is, is attestation of keys. So rather than machine state attestation, we're going to do attestation that the key was birthed within a TPM. 
um, and therefore that we can be sure it's non-exfiltratable. We will then be able to use that from our CA and go, right, this is a TPM-backed key. We can give it a longer lifetime because we're sure it's hardware-backed, and that will then mean that we can be more confident. Thing. And we will eventually get that to um, being able to tie it down to um, machine state as well if we wish, right? There, there are some issues about firmware attestation that just make life complicated there. I think there's uh, things like the reproducible builds the previous speaker talked about um, get us to a point where we can do some more software state attestation. Certainly on the, the Linux stack upwards we should now be able to get to the point that we can tie a key to a known good software image. That'll come to start with. We're looking at a key state attestation. Um, I think Five more minutes. Five more minutes to talk. Um, and then five minutes for questions. Okay, I've been looking at the clock at the back, which I think is slightly off. Um, any questions on that? I think I've gone through it slightly faster than I intended, but. Uh, uh, hi. My question isn't probably directly uh, related to, to the server work uh, you described. Uh, but I've been wondering for quite some time, how do you update servers? Uh, how do you reseal uh, secrets for, for TPMs? Because uh, as far as I can comprehend, you have to unseal stuff, make an update, measure it, and reseal it. Uh, reseal secrets to, to new, new PCR values. Is there, is there any way wh wh where you can determine uh, PCR values ahead and make uh, TPM uh, use the new uh, values on the next boot? So it is possible to seal um, data to a specific set of PCR values without the TPM currently being in that state, and we've done some work with that. That needs you to be able to calculate what those PCR values will be, which is one of the problems we've seen with firmware attestation, but generally from a, a software stack point of view, if you're talking about upgrading to a, a reproducible image, you know what's going to be measured in, so you can make those calculations and do the resealing. For a lot of our use cases, um, if the measurements change, we're currently fine with regenerating a key. Um, generally, the measurements will change when we're changing machine state in a way where we can just generate a new key and generate a new cert for it, but there are mechanisms by which you can seal to a set of PCR values, even off host, right? So I can seal to a, a TPM without having physical access to that TPM, so it can be done. Also check Leonard's talk later today because he talks about exactly that stuff. How do you verify the origin of a key? You said that you wanted to attest that the key is backed by the TPM. So, so um, TP TPMs all have a permanent key in them called the endorsement key, which is unique per TPM and doesn't change. That has a certificate generally in the TPM that is issued by the TPM manufacturer. So at a very crude first thing you can say, this, and the key TPM can then do a dance that will say that any key it has generated has been generated in it and that is then chained back to the endorsement key. So given the endorsement key, you can do an attestation dance that says this was definitely generated by a TPM. The problem you get there is that you don't know that it was your TPM, you just know it was generated by a TPM from that manufacturer. Um, there's two ways around that. One is what we're probably going to go with just because of the, the way our systems work is that it'll be trust on first use, right? So we will enroll the endorsement key the first time we see the machine. Um, there are there's work in the TCG um, group about actually providing a, a unified way of getting what's called a platform cert, which will then be a certificate from the manufacturer that ties the endorsement key from a TPM back to the serial number of a machine. So that gives you an even stronger guarantee, and we've seen some of that in our client devices where we can say, this client device, this laptop with this serial number is issued to this user. We want to issue a certificate for a particular user it is attested by the TPM that is also confirmed as being in that machine, so that gives you a very strong trust guarantee. But essentially, it all comes back to the endorsement key in the TPM and then having the appropriate certificate on that that says it's either bound to the machine or bound to a manufacturer. Uh, did you do, do this only on bare metal or did you do something with VMs? So, because QEMA has something like a TPM implementation somehow and then maybe you open, I don't know. But I think the high speed problem gets even worse with VMs, isn't it? 
Y yeah, so, so um, TPMs are an open problem, and we've kind of got a few thoughts about that. Obviously, a software TPM doesn't give us the hardware, gu the um, security guarantees we're looking for. Um, one option is we build some form of multiplexer. We know what operations are happening with the TPM. Uh, it's generally about loading a key, using it for a signing operation, or doing an attestation with it, um, and then unloading it. So we could multiplex. That's Lots of VMs in a machine makes that incredibly slow on the TPM, but it could be done. Uh, there's some work on confidential VMs and AMD, SEV, SNP, and doing a virtual TPM that lives inside a confidential compute um, environment. We're going to look at that one, which will give us some speed. Um, but yeah, open question. Um, we definitely want to retain the security guarantees. So it's either got to be a multiplex back to a hardware back thing or um, some sort of confidential compute based. Any other question? Yes. So I could be completely wrong. I hope I'm completely wrong. Uh, I've heard that the PCR values are extremely fragile, uh, that you know, changes in timing during the boot sequence can, can affect whether or not things unlock. So, so that, that's not been our experience. Um, at a very high level, uh, some of the issues we've seen with PCR values are, you know, historically in RDs were created on every single machine separately. So therefore you had a different in RD value for every single machine. So a centralized attestation couldn't trust the value. The other thing we've seen is um, if a uh, bit flips in firmware, um, flashes, so the firmware will boot fine, but the, a bit will be flipped somewhere, so the PCR value doesn't match your calculated value. But those are generally stable problems. They, they occur, you can check what they are, certainly not timing related issues. So the example uh, people always give me is, you know, if you interrupt the boot process to go into the BIOS, then you Break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, That's it, it, obvious, it, it, there, there is a piece about, um, you know, if you interrupt Grub, Grub will measure different things in because you've done different commands, and that's actually something you absolutely want to detect, right? You, you don't want to boot um, a non-modified image. Doing something bad at that point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So you systemly boot, and then you won't have the problem. <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question on curiosity about your fleet. Is it all TPM 2.0 or do you have legacy ones? <sighs> Second one down, TPM 1.2, not tested. My, my, my fervent hope is that by the time we completed all of the other pieces of infrastructure here, there will either be no TPM 1.2 devices left or there will be few enough that I can legitimately tell people to replace them. So the number's going down. Um, they're on older machines. Some of them can do an upgrade to T.2.0, but uh, no, we unfortunately still have TPM 1.2 devices. Good. Have you, hello? Have you also thought about um, how to protect uh, stuff that, um, stuff like the Intel ME, the UAFI, disk firmware, this kind of stuff that's kind of hard to measure because it happens very early during boot? So, so firmware side of things? Yeah, like, ver like trusting the machine before TPM becomes trustable. So um, th there, there's a piece about roots of trust, which I think is a different thing to that. Uh, for trusting the machine before TPM, you can build a chain of trust back to initial uh, clock or initial instructions run by the CPU using the likes of Intel's what was TXT is now CBNT and AMD's PSP. So you can trust that the all firmware up run by the CPU will be measured into the TPM. Um, there are complexities about that with things like firmware revisions and does the firmware actually measure everything it should and is there other bit flips. That covers what runs on the CPU. For trusting things like disk firmware and NIC firmware, it turns out firmware on PCIe switches and, and also GPUs. Um, there are, there's a thing called SPDM and DICE, which will then mean you can do attestation of firmware on those devices. We don't currently do that. It is something we have investigated. It is something I think will come back, but there is more of a push that um, hardware devices that run firmware can now do attestation using DICE um, via the SPDM protocol, and you can then do some sort of checks there. Very quick.
Thanks for the talk. Do you have opinions on the use of discrete versus firmware TPMs? Oh, the discrete. Um, yes, I do. Um, I keep running into arguments with people about this. Obviously, firmware TPMs are cheaper and faster. Um, no one has given me a comprehensive discussion of exactly how they work in a way that makes me happy with their security. I know that earlier Intel ones were based on SGX and therefore vulnerable to the side channel attacks um, that have come out in modern silicon. I believe that current um, firmware TPMs either run on the Intel ME engine or the AMD PSP, so they're not running on the main CPU cores. That gives me some confidence that they're a better thing, but, but not sure. Uh, the other problem I've seen with them is that generally they don't come with EK certificates. So because the key is changed by the firmware upgrades, you end up losing things when the firmware upgrades. You don't get an EK certificate, so you don't get that firm trust path back to this is definitely hardware backed. That may not be true in all cases. It just matches what my current experience is. Um, so. Okay, that is all. Let's thank Jonathan. Thank you.